the companion. Now, Dr. Lloyd, says Miss Heller, don't you know any creepy stories? She smiled at him, the smile that nightly bewitched the theatre-going public. Jane Hellier was sometimes called the most beautiful woman in England, and jealous members of her own profession were in the habit of saying to each other, of course Jane's not an artist. She can't act, if you know what I mean. It's those eyes. And those eyes were at this minute fixed appealingly on the grizzled elderly bachelor doctor, who for the last five years had ministered to the ailments of the village of St. Mary Mead. With an unconscious gesture, the doctor pulled down his waistcoat, inclined of late to be uncomfortably tight, and racked his brains hastily so as not to disappoint the lovely creature who addressed him so confidently. I feel, said Jane dreamily, that I would like to wallow in crime this evening. Splendid, said Colonel Bantry, her host. Splendid, splendid. And he laughed a loud, hearty, military laugh. Eh, Dolly? His wife hastily recalled to the exigencies of social life. She had been planning her spring border, agreed enthusiastically. Of course it's splendid, she said heartily, but vaguely. I always thought so. Did you, my dear, said old Miss Marple, and her eyes twinkled a little. We don't get much in the creepy line, and still less in the criminal line, in St. Mary Mead, you know, Miss Hellyer, said Dr. Lloyd. You surprise me, said Sir Henry Clithering. The ex-commissioner of Scotland Yard turned to Miss Marple. I always understood from our friend here that St. Mary Mead is a positive hotbed of crime and vice. Oh, Sir Henry, protested Miss Marple, a spot of colour coming into her cheeks, I'm sure. I never said anything of the kind. The only thing I ever said was that human nature is much the same in a village as anywhere else, only one has opportunities and leisure for seeing it at closer quarters. But you haven't always lived here, said Jane Hellier, still addressing the doctor. You've been in all sorts of queer places all over the world, places where things happen. That is so, of course, the doctor lawyer is still thinking desperately. Yes, of course. Yes. Ah, now I have it. He sank back with a sigh of relief. It's some years ago now, I'd almost forgotten, but the facts were really very strange, very strange indeed. And the final coincidence which put the clue into my hand was strange also. Miss Hellier drew her chair a little nearer to him, applied some lipstick, and waited expectantly. The others also turned interested faces towards him. I don't know whether any of you know the Canary Islands, began the doctor. Oh, they must be wonderful, said Jane Hellier. They're in the South Seas, aren't they? Or is it in the Mediterranean? I've called in there on my way to South Africa, said the colonel. The peak of Tenerife is a fine sight with the setting sun on it. The incident I'm describing happened in the island of Gran Canary, not Tenerife. It's a good many years ago now. I had had a breakdown in health and was forced to give up my practice in England to go abroad. I practiced in Las Palmas, which is the principal town of Gran Canary. In many ways, I enjoyed the life out there very much. The climate was mild and sunny, there was excellent surf bathing, and I am an enthusiastic bather, and the sea life of the port attracted me. Ships from all over the world put in at Las Palmas. I used to walk along the mole every morning, far more interested than any member of the fair sex could be in a street of hat shops. As I say, ships from all over the world put in at Las Palmas. Sometimes they stayed a few hours, sometimes a day or two. In the principal hotel there, the Metropole, you'll see people of all races and nationalities, birds of passage. Even the people going to Tenerife usually come here and stay a few days before crossing to the other island. My story begins there, in the Metropole Hotel, one Thursday evening in January. There was a dance going on, and I and my friend had been sitting at a small table watching the scene. There were a fair sprinkling of English and other nationalities, but the majority of the dancers were Spanish. And when the orchestra struck up a tango, only half a dozen couples of the latter nationality took the floor. They all danced well, and we looked on and admired. 
One woman in particular excited our lively admiration. Tall, beautiful, and sinuous, she moved with the grace of a half-tamed leopardess. There was something dangerous about her. I said as much to my friend, and he agreed. Women like that, he said, are bound to have a history. Life will not pass them by. Beauty is perhaps a dangerous possession, I said. Not only beauty, he insisted, there's something else. Now look at her again. Things are bound to happen to that woman or because of her. As I said, life will not pass her by. Strange and exciting events will surround her. You've only got to look at her to know it. He paused and then added with a smile, Just as you've only got to look at those two women over there and to know nothing out of the way could ever happen to either of them. They're made for a safe and uneventful existence. I followed his eyes. The two women he referred to were travellers who had just arrived. A Holland Lloyd boat had put into port that evening, and the passengers were just beginning to arrive. As I looked at them, I thought once what my friend meant. They were two English ladies, the thoroughly nice travelling English that you do find abroad. Their ages, I should say, were round about forty. One was fair and a, a little, just a little, too plump. The other was dark and a little, again, just a little, inclined to scragginess. They were what is called well-preserved, quietly and inconspicuously dressed in well-cut tweeds and innocent of any kind of make-up. They had that air of quiet assurance which is the birthright of well-bred English women. There was nothing remarkable about either of them. They were like thousands of their sisters. They would doubtless see what they wished to see, assisted by Baedeker, and be blind to everything else. They would use the English library and attend the English church in any place they happened to be, and it was quite likely that one or both of them sketched a little. And as my friend said, nothing exciting or remarkable would ever happen to either of them, though they might quite likely travel half over the world. I looked from them back to our sinuous Spanish woman with her half-closed, smouldering eyes, and I smiled. Poor thing, said Jane Hellyer with a sigh, but I don't think it's so silly of people not to make the most of themselves. That woman in Bond Street, Valentine, is really wonderful. Audrey Denman goes to her. Have you seen her in the downward step? As a schoolgirl in the first act, she's really marvellous. And yet Audrey's fifty if she's a day, and as a matter of fact, I happen to know she's really near to sixty. Go on, said Mrs. Bantry to Dr. Lloyd. I love stories about sinuous Spanish dancers. It makes me forget how old and fat I am. I'm sorry, said Dr. Lloyd apologetically, but you see, as a matter of fact, this story isn't about the Spanish woman. Isn't. No. As it happens, my friend and I were wrong. Nothing in the least exciting happened to the Spanish beauty. She married a clerk in a shipping office, and by the time I left the island, she had five children and was getting very fat. Just like that girl of Israel Peters, commented Miss Marple, the one who went on the stage and had such good legs that they made her principal boy in the pantomime. Everyone said she'd come to no good, but she married a commercial traveller and settled down splendidly. The village parallel, murmured Sir Henry softly. No, went on the doctor, my story is about the two English ladies. Something happened to them, breathed Miss Hellyer. Something happened to them on the very next day, too. Yes, said Mrs. Bantry encouragingly. Just for curiosity, as I went out that evening, I glanced at the hotel register. I found the names easily enough. Miss Mary Barton and Miss Amy Durrant of Little Paddocks, Corton Weir, Bucks. I little thought then how soon I was to encounter the owner of those names again, and under what tragic circumstances. The following day I had arranged to go for a picnic with some friends. We were to motor across the island, taking our lunch to a place called, as far as I remember, it's so long ago, Las Nieves, a well-sheltered bay where we could bathe if we felt inclined. This program we duly carried out, except that we were somewhat late in starting, so that we stopped on the way and picnicked, going on to Las Nieves afterwards for a bathe before tea. As we approached the beach, we were at once aware of a tremendous commotion. The whole population of the small village seemed to be gathered on the shore. 
As soon as they saw us, they rushed towards the car and began explaining excitedly. My Spanish not being very good, it took me a few minutes to understand, but at last I got it. Two of the mad English ladies had gone in to bathe, and one had swum out too far and got into difficulties. The other had gone after her and had tried to bring her in, but her strength in turn had failed, and she too would have been drowned had not a man rowed out in a boat and brought in rescuer and rescued, the latter beyond help. As soon as I got the hang of things, I pushed the crowd aside and hurried down to the beach. I did not at first recognize the two women, the plump figure in the black stockinette costume and the tight green rubber bathing cap awoke no cord of recognition as she looked up anxiously. She was kneeling beside the body of her friend, making somewhat amateurish attempts at artificial respiration. When I told her that I was a doctor, she gave a sigh of relief, and I ordered her off at once to one of the cottages for a rub-down and dry clothing. One of the ladies in my party went with her. I myself worked unavailingly on the body of the drowned woman in vain. Life was only too clearly extinct, and in the end I had reluctantly to give in. I rejoined the others in the small fisherman's cottage, and there I had to break the sad news. The survivor was attired now in her own clothes, and I immediately recognized her as one of the two arrivals of the night before. She received the sad news fairly calmly, and it was evidently the horror of the whole thing that struck her more than any great personal feeling. Poor Amy, she said. Poor, poor Amy. She'd been looking forward to the bathing here so much, and she was a good swimmer, too. I can't understand it. What do you think it can have been, Doctor? Possibly cramp. Will you tell me exactly what happened? We had both been swimming about for some time, Twenty minutes, I should say. Then I thought I would go in, but Amy said she was going to swim out once more. She did so, and suddenly I heard her call and realized that she was crying for help. I swam out as fast as I could. She was still afloat when I got to her, but she clutched me wildly, and we both went under. If it hadn't been for that man coming out with his boat, I should have been drowned too. That has happened fairly often, I said. To save anyone from drowning... Is not an easy affair. Seems so awful, continued Miss Barton. We only arrived yesterday. We were so delighting in the sunshine and our little holiday, and now this terrible tragedy occurs. I asked her then for particulars about the dead woman, explaining that I would do everything I could for her, but that the Spanish authorities would require full information. This she gave me readily enough. The dead woman, Miss Amy Durrant, was her companion, and had come to her about five months previously. They had got on very well together, but Miss Durrant had spoken very little about her people. She had been left an orphan at an early age, and had been brought up by an uncle, and had earned her own living since she was twenty-one. And so that was that, went on the doctor. He paused and said again, but this time with a certain finality in his voice. And so... That was that. I don't understand, said Jane Hellyer. Is that all? I mean, it's very tragic, and I suppose, but it isn't, well, it isn't what I call creepy. I think there's more to follow, said Sir Henry. Yes, said Dr. Lloyd, there's more to follow. You see, right at the time, there was one queer thing. Of course, I asked questions of the fishermen, etc., as to what they'd seen. They were eyewitnesses. And one woman had rather a funny story. I didn't pay any attention to it at the time, but it came back to me afterwards. She insisted, you see, that Miss Durrant wasn't in difficulties when she called out. The other swam out to her, and according to this woman, deliberately held Miss Durrant's head underwater. I didn't, as I say, pay much attention. It was such a fantastic story, and these things look so differently from the shore. Miss Barton might have tried to make her friend lose consciousness, realizing that the latter's panic-stricken clutching would drown them both. You see, according to the Spanish woman's story, it looked as though, well, as though Miss Barton was deliberately trying to drown her companion. As I say, I paid very little attention to this story at the time. It, it came back to me later. Our great difficulty was to find out anything about this woman, Amy Durrant. 
She didn't seem to have any relations. Miss Barton and I went through her things together. We found one address and wrote there, but it proved to be simply a room that she had taken in which to keep some of her things. The landlady knew nothing, but only seen her when she took the room. Miss Durrant had remarked at the time that she always liked to have one place she could call her own, to which she could return at any moment. There were one or two nice pieces of old furniture, and some bound numbers of academy pictures, and a trunk full of pieces of material bought at sales, but no personal belongings. She had mentioned to the landlady that her father and mother had died in India when she was a child, and that she had been brought up by an uncle who was a clergyman but she did not say if he was her father's or her mother's brother. So the name was no guide. It wasn't exactly mysterious. It was just unsatisfactory. There must be many lonely women, proud and reticent, in just that position. There were a couple of old photographs amongst her belongings in Las Palmas, rather old and faded and they'd been cut to fit the frames they were in, so that there was no photographer's name on them. And there was an old daguerreotype, which might have been her mother, or more probably her grandmother. Miss Barton had had two references with her. One she had forgotten, the other name she recollected after an effort. It proved to be that of a lady who was now abroad, having gone to Australia. She was written to. Her answer, of course, was a long time in coming, and I may say that when it did arrive, there was no particular help to be gained from it. She said Miss Durrant had been with her as companion, and had been most efficient, and that she was a very charming woman, but that she knew nothing of her private affairs or relations. So there it was. As I say, nothing unusual, really. It was just the two things together that aroused my uneasiness. This Amy Durrant of whom no one knew anything, and the, the Spanish woman's queer story. Yes, and I'll add a third thing. When I was first bending over the body, and Miss Barton was walking away towards the huts, she looked back. Looked back with an expression on her face that I can only describe as one of poignant anxiety, a kind of anguished uncertainty that imprinted itself on my brain didn't strike me as anything unusual at the time. I put it down to her terrible distress over her friend. But you see, later, I realized that they weren't on those terms. There was no devoted attachment between them, no terrible grief. Miss Barton was fond of Amy Durrant and was shocked by her death. But that was all. But then, why that terrible, poignant anxiety? That was the question that kept coming back to me. I had not been mistaken in that look. And almost against my will, an answer began to shape itself in my mind. Supposing the Spanish woman's story were true. Supposing that Mary Barton willfully and in cold blood tried to drown Amy Durrant. She succeeds in holding her under water while pretending to be saving her. She is rescued by a boat. They are on a lonely beach far from anywhere. And then I appear. The last thing she expects, a doctor, and an English doctor. She knows well enough that people who have been underwater far longer than Amy Durrant have been revived by artificial respiration. But she has to play her part, to go off leaving me alone with her victim. And as she turns for one last look, a terrible, poignant anxiety shows in her face. Will Amy Durrant come back to life and tell what she knows? Oh, said Jane Hillier, I'm thrilled now. Viewed in that aspect, the whole business seemed more sinister, and the personality of Amy Durrant became more mysterious. Who was Amy Durrant? Why should she, an insignificant paid companion, be murdered by her employer? What story lay behind that fatal bathing expedition? She had entered Mary Barton's employment only a few months before. Mary Barton had brought her abroad, and the very day after they landed, the tragedy had occurred. 
and they were both nice, commonplace, refined English women. The whole thing was fantastic, and I told myself so. I'd been letting my imagination run away with me. You didn't do anything then, asked Miss Hellyer. My dear young lady, what could I do? There was no evidence. The majority of the eyewitnesses told the same story as Miss Barton. I had built up my own suspicions out of a fleeting expression which I might quite possibly have imagined. The only thing I could do and did do was to see that the widest inquiries were made for the relations of Amy Durrant. The next time I was in England, I even went and saw the landlady of her room, with the results I told you. But you felt there was something wrong, said Miss Marple. Dr. Lloyd nodded. Half the time I was ashamed of myself for thinking so. Who was I to go suspecting this nice, pleasant-mannered English lady of a foul and cold-blooded crime? I did my best to be as cordial as possible to her during the short time she stayed on the island. I, I helped her with the Spanish authorities. I did everything I could do as an Englishman to help a compatriot in a foreign country. And yet I'm convinced that she knew I suspected and disliked her. How long did she stay out there? asked Miss Marple. I think it was about a fortnight. Miss Durrant was buried there, and it must have been about ten days later when she took a boat back to England. The shock had upset her so much that she felt she couldn't spend the winter there as she had planned. That's what she said. Did it seem to have upset her? asked Miss Marple. The doctor hesitated. Well, I don't know that it affected her appearance at all, he said cautiously. She didn't, for instance, grow fatter, asked Miss Marple. Do you know? It's a curious thing you're saying that. Now I come to think back, I believe you're right. Yes, she, yes, she did seem, if anything, to be putting on weight. How horrible, said Jane Hellyer with a shudder. It's like, it's like fattening on your victim's blood. And yet, in another way, I may be doing her an injustice, went on Dr. Lloyd. She certainly said something before she left which pointed in an entirely different direction. There may be, I think there are, consciences which work very slowly, which take some time to awake the enormity of the deed committed. It was the evening before her departure from the Canaries. She had asked me to go and see her and had thanked me very warmly for all that I had done to help her. I, of course, made light of the matter, said I had only done what was natural under the circumstances and so on. There was a pause after that, and then she suddenly asked me a question. Do you think, she asked, that one is ever justified in taking the law into one's own hands? I replied that that was rather a difficult question, but on the whole I thought not. The law was the law, and we had to abide by it, even when it is powerless. I don't quite understand. It's difficult to explain, but one might do something that is considered definitely wrong, that is considered a crime even, for a very good and sufficient reason. I replied dryly that, Possibly several criminals had thought that in their time, and she shrank back. Oh, but that's horrible, she murmured. Horrible. And then, with a change of tone, she asked me to give her something to make her sleep. She had not been able to sleep properly since, she hesitated, since that terrible shock. You're sure it is that? There's nothing worrying you, nothing on your mind? On my mind? What should be on my mind? She spoke fiercely and suspiciously. Worry is a cause of sleeplessness sometimes, I said lightly. She seemed to brood for a moment. Do you mean worrying over the future or worrying over the past, which can't be altered? Either. Only it wouldn't be any good worrying over the past you couldn't bring back. Oh, what's the use? One mustn't think. One must not think. I prescribed her a mild sleeping draught and made my adieu. 
As I went away, I wondered not a little over the words she had spoken. You couldn't bring back... What? Or who? I think that last interview prepared me in a way for what was to come. I didn't expect it, of course, but when it happened, I wasn't surprised. Because, you see, Mary Barton struck me all along as a conscientious woman. Not a weak sinner, but a woman with convictions who would act up to them and who would not relent as long as she still believed in them. I fancied that in that last conversation we had, she was beginning to doubt her own convictions. I know her words suggested to me that she was feeling the first faint beginnings of that terrible soul-searcher, remorse. The thing happened in Cornwall in a small watering place rather deserted at that season of the year. Must have been, let me see, uh, late March. I read about it in the papers. A lady had been staying at a small hotel there, a Miss Barton. She'd been very odd and peculiar in her manner. That had been noticed by all. At night she would walk up and down her room, muttering to herself and not allowing the people on either side of her to sleep. She called on the vicar one day and told him that she had a communication of the gravest importance to make to him. She had, she said, committed a crime. Then instead of proceeding, she had stood up abruptly and said she would call another day. The vicar put her down as being slightly unbalanced and did not take her self-accusation seriously. The very next morning she was found to be missing from her room. A note was left dressed to the coroner. It ran as follows. I tried to speak to the vicar yesterday to confess all, but was not allowed. She would not let me. I can make amends only one way. A life for a life. And my life must go the same way as hers did. I, too, must drown in the deep sea. I believed I was justified. I see now that that was not so. If I desire Amy's forgiveness, I must go to her. Let no one be blamed for my death. Mary Barton. Her clothes were found lying on the beach in a secluded cove nearby, and it seemed clear that she had undressed there and swum resolutely out to sea, where the current was known to be dangerous, sweeping one down the coast. The body was not discovered. But after a time, leave was given to presume death. She was a rich woman, her estate being proved at a hundred thousand pounds. Since she died and tested, it all went to her next of kin, a family of cousins in Australia. The papers made discreet references to the tragedy in the Canary Islands, putting forward the theory that the death of Miss Durrant had unhinged her friend's brain. At the inquest, the usual verdict of suicide whilst temporarily insane was returned. And so the curtain falls on the tragedy of Amy Durrant and Mary Barton. There was a long pause, and then Jane Hellyer gave a great gasp. Oh, but you mustn't stop there. Just in the most interesting part, go on. But you see, Miss Hellyer, this isn't a serial story. This is real life, and real life stops just where it chooses. But I don't want it to, said Jane. I want to know. This is where we use our brains, Miss Hellyer, explains Henry. Why did Mary Barton kill her companion? That's the problem Dr. Lloyd has set us. Oh, well, said Miss Hellyer, she might have killed her for lots of reasons. I mean, oh, I don't know, she might have got on her nerves, or else she got jealous, although Dr. Lloyd doesn't mention any men, but still on the boat out. Well... You know what everyone says about boats and sea voyages. Miss Helia paused, slightly out of breath, and it was borne in upon her audience that the outside of Jane's charming head was distinctly superior to the inside. I would like to have a lot of guesses, said Mrs. Bantry, and I suppose I must confine myself to one. Well, I think that Miss Barton's father made all his money out of ruining Amy Durrant's father, so 
Amy determined to have her revenge. Oh, no. It's the wrong way round. How tiresome. Why does the rich employer kill the humble companion? I've got it. Miss Barton had a young brother who shot himself for love of Amy Durrant. Miss Barton waits her time. Amy comes down in the world. Miss B engages her as a companion and takes her to the Canaries and accomplishes her revenge. Now, how's that? Excellent, said Sir Henry, and if we don't know that Miss Barton ever had a young brother. We deduce that, said Mrs. Bantry, unless she had a young brother, there's no motive, so she must have had a young brother. Do you see, Watson? Well, that's all very fine, Dolly, said her husband, but it's only a guess. Of course it is, said Mrs. Bantry, that's all we can do, guess. We haven't got any clues. Go on, dear, have a guess yourself. Oh, my word, I don't know what to say, but I think there's something in this Helio's suggestion that they fell out about a man. Now, look here, Dolly, it was probably some high church parson. They both embroidered him a cope or something, and he wore the Dunham woman's first. Depend upon it, it was something like that. Look how she went off to a parson at the end. These women all lose their heads over good-looking clergymen. You hear of it over and over again. I think I must try and make my explanation a little more subtle, said Sir Henry, though I admit it's only a guess. I suggest that Miss Barton was always mentally unhinged. There were more cases like that than you would imagine. Her mania grew stronger, and she began to believe it her duty to rid the world of certain persons, possibly what is termed unfortunate females. Nothing much is known about Miss Durrant's past, so very possibly she had a past. An unfortunate one. Miss Barton learns of this and decides on extermination. Later, the righteousness of her act begins to trouble her, and she's overcome by remorse. Her end shows her to be completely unhinged. Now, I do say you agree with me, Miss Marple. I'm afraid I don't, Sir Henry, said Miss Marple, smiling apologetically. I think her end shows her to have been a very clever and resourceful woman. Jane Hellyer interrupted with a little scream. Oh, I've been so stupid. May I guess again? Of course it must have been that. Blackmail. The companion woman was blackmailing her. Only I don't see why Miss Marple says it was clever of her to kill herself. I can't see that at all. Ah, said Sir Henry, you see, Miss Marple knew a case just like it in St. Mary Mead. You always laugh at me, Sir Henry, said Miss Marple reproachfully. I must confess it does remind me just a little of old Mrs. Trout. She drew the old age pension, you know, for three old women who were dead in different parishes. Sounds like a most complicated and resourceful crime, said Sir Henry, but it doesn't seem to throw much light upon our present problem. Of course not, said Miss Marple. It wouldn't, to you. But some of the families were very poor, and the old age pension was a great boon to the children. I know it's difficult for anyone outside to understand, but what I, I really meant was that the whole thing hinged upon one old woman being so like any other old woman. Eh? said Sir Henry, mystified. Oh, I always explain things so badly. What I mean is that when Dr. Lloyd described the two ladies first, he didn't know which was which. And I don't suppose anyone else in the hotel did. They would have, of course, after a day or so, but the very next day, one of the two was drowned. And if the one who was left said she was Miss Barton, I don't suppose it would ever occur to anyone else that she might be. You think... Oh, I see, said Sir Henry slowly. It's the only natural way of thinking of it. Dear Mrs. Bantry began that way just now. Why should the rich employer kill the humble companion? So much more likely to be the other way about. I mean, that's the way things happen. Is it, said Sir Henry? You shock me. But of course, went on Miss Marple, she would have had to wear Miss Barton's clothes, and they would probably be a little tight on her, so that her general appearance would look as though she had got a little fatter. That's why I asked that question. A gentleman would be sure to think it was the lady who had got fatter, and not the clothes had got smaller, though that isn't quite the right way of putting it. But if Amy Durrant killed Miss Barton, what did she gain by it, asked Mrs. Bantry? She couldn't keep up the deception forever. 
She only kept it up for another month or so, pointed out Miss Marple, and during that time I expect she travelled, keeping away from anyone who might know her. That's what I meant by saying that one lady of a certain age looks so like another. I don't suppose the different photograph on her passport was ever noticed. You know what passports are. And then in March, she went down to this Cornish place and began to act queerly and draw attention to herself so that when people found her clothes on the beach and read her last letter, they shouldn't think of the common-sense conclusion. Which was, asked Sir Henry, no body, said Miss Marple firmly. That's the thing that would stare you in the face if there weren't such a lot of red headings to draw you off the trail, including the suggestion of foul play and remorse. No body. That was the real significant fact. Do you mean, said Mrs. Bandry, do you mean that there wasn't any remorse, that there wasn't, that she didn't drown herself? Not she, said Miss Marple. It's just Mrs. Trout over again. Mrs. Trout was very good at red herrings, but she met her match in me, and I can see through your remorse-driven Miss Barton. Drown herself? Went off to Australia, if I'm any good at guessing. You are, Miss Marple, said Dr. Lloyd. Undoubtedly you are. Now it again took me quite by surprise. Why, you could have knocked me down with a feather that day in Melbourne. Was that what you spoke of as a final coincidence? Dr. Lloyd nodded. Yes, rather rough luck on Miss Barton, or Miss Amy Durrant, whatever you like to call her. I became a ship's doctor for a while, and landing in Melbourne, the first person I saw as I walked down the street was the lady I thought had been drowned in Cornwall. She saw the game was up as far as I was concerned, and she did the bold thing. Took me into her confidence. Curious woman, completely lacking, I suppose, in some moral sense. She was the eldest of a family of nine, all wretchedly poor. They had applied once for help to their rich cousin in England and been repulsed. Miss Barton having quarrelled with their father. Money was wanted desperately, for the three youngest children were delicate and wanted expensive medical treatment. Amy Barton, then and there, seems to have decided on her plan of cold-blooded murder. She set out for England, working her passage over as a children's nurse. She obtained the situation of companion to Miss Barton, calling herself Amy Durrant. She engaged a room and put some furniture in it so as to create more of a personality for herself. The drowning plan was a sudden inspiration. She'd been waiting for some opportunity to present itself. Then she staged the final scene of the drama and returned to Australia. And in due time, she and her brothers and sisters inherited Miss Barton's money as next of kin. A very bold and perfect crime, said Sir Henry. Almost the perfect crime. If it had been Miss Barton who had died in the Canaries, suspicion might have attached to Amy Dunham and her connection with the Barton family might have been discovered. But the change of identity and the double crime, as you may call it, effectually did away with that. Yes, almost the perfect crime. What happened to her, asked Mrs. Bantry. What did you do in the matter, Dr. Lloyd? I was in a very curious position, Mrs. Bantry. Of evidence, as the law understands it, I still had very little. Also, there were certain signs, plain to me as a medical man, that though strong and vigorous in appearance, the lady was not long for this world. I went home with her and saw the rest of the family. A charming family, devoted to their elder sister and without an idea in their heads that she might prove to have committed a crime. Why bring sorrow on them when I could prove nothing? The lady's admission to me was unheard by anyone else. I let nature take its course. Miss Amy Barton died six months after my meeting with her. I've often wondered if she was cheerful and unrepentant up to the end. Surely not, said Mrs. Bantry. I expect so, said Miss Marple. Mrs. Trout was. Jane Hellier gave herself a little shake. Well, she said, it's very, very thrilling. I don't quite understand now who drowned which. And how does this Mrs. Trout come into it? She doesn't, my dear, said Miss Marple. She was only a person, not a very nice person, in the village. Oh, 
Elsie Jane in the village, but nothing ever happens in a village, does it? She sighed. Oh, I'm sure I shouldn't have any brains at all if I lived in a village. <laughs>